Okay, welcome everybody to the Probate Mastery Weekly Group Coaching Call. Kat, I did see that you got our podcast from yesterday published, so I'll start with that. One thing I want to point you guys to, if you didn't watch it already, did a call yesterday with one of the leading professional in conversational AI in the real estate space, structurally. We talk a lot about scripts and lead nurturing and looking for ways to supplement what we do from a marketing standpoint. And we had the, the unique opportunity to pick the brain of a tech guy who's been able to record and analyze over 4 million real estate conversations and writing. A lot of folks claim to have true artificial intelligence. What they have are just simple chat bots. And uh, these guys actually have true empathy and linguistics built into their platform. So it was an opportunity to just talk to somebody that's a leader in that space and, and hear what they've learned in seeing 4 million conversations across all different lead types and all different markets. So if you haven't had a chance, check that out. I think you might find it interesting. And that's about all I have for the week. If anybody has any questions, anything we can help you with, how can we serve you? Chad, this is Eric. I was just getting off the, the call with you and Nate Jones from yesterday. And man, just so many, uh, part of me feels like this technology portion is literally taking over the psychology of how humanity responds and why they're so guarded. And I, I really like some of the key points that you guys pointed out in there. And I'm definitely going to listen to that one over and over again. But with that being said, I'm looking for some real human non-negotiables that I can start making a daily part of my probate business that can get me off this feast and famine roller coaster you, you talk so freely of. So what, tell me more about what you're looking for. What are the, the, the non-negotiables? What did it explain? But I kind of find myself still tending to fires that, that are needed to be resolved, whether it's like drop everything and go after a lead, which is obviously the most uh, highest and best use of my time versus saying, no matter what's going on, you guard this 90 minutes a day, you spend time working on better so, processes, better systems, like absolutely non-negotiable from this time, Eric, I don't care what's going on in your life. You are to do this every single day. Tony Robbins has a course that was originally called RPM, rap, the rapid planning method. And I think it evolved into the time of your life, but that course talks about, and it's very valuable in all aspects of your life, but in business and personal life, but it talks about the, the, a target. So you basically have a bullseye, which is what you're focused on. And, and what Tony, his personal application of that is 65, it's, excuse me, if you can imagine an X and a Y axis and the two variables are on those axes are urgency and importance. And we tend to focus on the things that are urgent uh, and unimportant more than anything, like email, text messages, the stuff sure, that social sure. media, the stuff that seems easy. It, it's like, it's, it's unthreatening. So let's focus on that. Let's burn 30 minutes on Facebook. Anybody ever done that? Anybody ever waste? <laughs> Guilty. <laughs> yeah. So it, it's those, those two variables that you're managing and, and Tony's personal goal is to spend 65% of his time doing the things that are non-urgent, but important. For me, those are things like being able to leave my freaking cell phone and go for a mountain bike ride, go back to my family farm and help with an, a, a livestock obligation that I don't really care to do, but it's important to those people in my life, right? Like I don't want to be a cattle farmer, but they do. So it's important important for me to contribute to that because there are people I love and want to support. Things in business tend to be, we have important and urgent things, and that's a closing. That's prospecting. Like it's urgent to prospect your probate list. It's also important to prospect that list. So those are things that you must do. And what you, what your goal is to delegate or just rid yourself of anything that is not urgent and not important. And those things like, so that's one way to look at it. And there's a cheat sheet. I was trying to figure out if I was going to do a video on this, or if I was going to write a long form blog, here is basically a summary of the a very comprehensive course. I think the course is designed to be took, taken over 10 days. It's broken into 10 segments. It's worth every penny of the whatever, 500 bucks or whatever that, that they, they charge for it. But that summary sheet will kind of give you each of those areas or the dimensions and the dimension of fulfillment, as Tony calls it, is the things that are important, but not urgent. And those tend to be more 
personal things. So recharging your battery, spending time with your kids, going to that baseball game, even though your team is going to lose like those things. So I would encourage you to look at that for, look for some inspiration. If you want like a long form education on time management and planning, that's probably the best resource I know of. There's another really good book that I'm failing to come up with the author's name. It's called Getting Things Done. There's some nuggets in there. I just can't think of the author right now. The name of the book is Getting Things Done. And then the last thing is what worked for me is I made some vows with myself in 2012, 13, I was running multiple real estate strategies across an investment brand, a, a real estate team brand. And I just, I, th there was literally more things to be done than there were seconds in the day. And I hadn't learned to, to delegate well, but what I ended up doing to rein it in was I made my calendar, my CEO, and I made a vow to myself that, that I would give it that authority. And I started to live and die by a Google calendar. And that really changed things for me. So with, with, with my goal was 12 hours of prospecting. So it, it, each day from 8, 8 a.m. to 10 a.m. and 4 p.m. to 6 p.m., Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, those were sacred prospecting blocks. So that gave me 12 hours a week to prospect. Now in between those blocks on Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, that was transaction coordination or office work. That was chasing paperwork, scheduling inspections, anything that needed to do to process a deal. So what that gave me was three solid days in the office. I did not take appointments on Monday. I only took appointments on Mondays and Fridays, whether they were buyer appointments or listing appointments or acquisitions, seldom make exceptions. It scared the hell out of me to try that because I'm like, oh, people are going to think I'm lazy or I'm unavailable and it's, this is going to hurt me. But it got to a point where I was willing to try it. What I learned was what was really surprising to me. People respected my time more, and by limiting access to me, people took me more seriously, especially buyers. You know how buyers will, will and I know you're not really working the buy side of brokerage, but a lot of people on here do, and they will run you ragged. What I found is I would show, after I started this, I showed an average of two homes to a buyer. And before the market average was probably a dozen, but it was because they had, I, I was more structured in what I did. They respected the boundary that I set. So something, it could be as simple as that, like literally make your calendar, your CEO be be diligent about making sure everything goes in there. And the way I use calendars, I have a personal calendar that I share, like a family calendar. Then I have a, a, a calendar for this business, a calendar for that business. They all flow up in the one calendar. But on the left, you can toggle them on and off. So you have, you know, one for this business, one for that business, one for your kids, one for your wife, things like that. But if you, as long as when that thing pops up and says, hey, Eric, you need to be doing this. If you consider that, if I don't do this, I have to fire myself. I have to quit because if I'm not responsible enough to take direction from who I've appointed as my CEO, which right now is going to be the calendar just to build a habit then how good am I anyways? And that was something that I just came up with on my own. I tried a lot of different things. That's the one that really kept me on track. And, and those became sacred time blocks that could not be violated. You, they, they weren't repurposed ever. And it's tough sometimes, like when there's fires burning all around you and everybody's wanting more and more of your time. Guess what? That's only getting worse. It's not getting better. How many text messages do you get a day? How many emails do you get a day? It's always going to grow in this type of culture that we've built. So the electronic distraction is only going to get worse and worse. So it's, you know, more important than ever that you get a system in place for yourself. So those are the best resources I have. You can just try to be more diligent and, and be really serious about your calendar. Use Calendly. Quit publishing a phone number use Calendly. And instead of having somebody inbound call you, every time you're interrupted, it's about 15 minutes for your brain to get back on track. Like limiting inbound calls is scary as hell for any salesperson, right? Why would I ever do that? That's insane. <laughs> However, it's yeah. quickly becoming the norm. I started using Calendly in May of 2019. When I came back from spending a month in Nepal completely off grid, I was just freaking bombarded. I literally had thousands and thousands of messages that I couldn't get to. And I was like, there's no way out of this. Like I'm never going to recover. So I started to pull my phone number off of it and everybody, including friends and family have to schedule into my calendar because it's, and so I fully committed to it at that point where in, in order to have access to me, it's through a calendar. So I have a podcast link. I have a personal or after hours call link. And surprisingly, even with friends and family, they're like, oh, okay, this is cool. I don't have to chase you. And I 
I hate your damn voicemail because my voicemail basically says, don't <laughs> good luck because I just can't keep up with it all. So inbounding, making things, making your outbound effort come to you, like inbound those out, the outbound calls that you need to make, if you can inbound those. So while you're doing transaction management or you're prospecting, people can be looking at your website, being on, be on your landing page, responding to your direct mail piece. But their call to action isn't call and distract me and get me off track for 15 minutes. Their call to action is respect my time and find a place to have a conversation with me. And I think what you'll find will be people actually do respect those boundaries. They don't criticize. Uh, I got I just, I've never had anyone go, I'm not easy to get a hold of, but people don't really get mad at me about it because I give them alternative ways to have access to me. Right? Yes. So just to recap, there's been a few people popping in and out, like the master's degree in this would be Tony Robbins, RPM or time of your life. There's someone actually backed me up. David Allen is the name of the author, David Allen, getting things done. And yeah, so Rosie recommended the E-Myth Revisit. That's one of the books in the, the probate mastery reading list. That book's incredibly good on taking even the most complex business and boiling it down to a franchise prototype where everything is systematic and documented and, and you have, and it, that, it also makes it really easy to hire and delegate if you get your business to that point. So those are the, the pointers that I have. Fantastic. I will start there. And I definitely love the calendar idea. That's definitely beautiful. Yeah. Now there's lots of folks on this call. And I, I tell you guys, what last week's call was amazing. And my team and our team meeting this morning, people commented on how, how nice it is to watch you guys coach each other and support each other. And that, man, that warms my heart. So there's a lot of folks on there who have built and scaled businesses. And Jonathan, for example, I'm sure you struggle with time management as a single pastor in a church when your whole congregation wants access to you. If you guys have any advice to share with Eric, please jump in. Thank I think you. honestly, it's training people. It's how you are congruent with your values and uh, what you really hold to be true. I've just found having an ideal week spent. I think production is more biology and vision than anything else. Meaning that, you know, if you're not eating, if you're not drinking, if you're not sleeping, you're really not going to do much. And so I'm like you, Chad, my, my Google calendar is my CEO. I don't have a to-do list. Everything goes there just like a budget. And my voicemails that I have at trains agents say, if you're calling after 7 p.m., I'll return your call the next business day. Those are the kind of things that I'm, I've had to do and, and are doing right now. Otherwise, it just would get consumed. Rosie, you had something to add? Rosie? Okay, this is my favorite topic, actually. Don't know how much this would be helpful for everyone, but my buyer's agent and I, we do 105 transactions a year between two producing agents. And most of my team is admin. Yeah. And uh, we often compete with groups that are seven, eight agents. And I'm about to share that my buyer's agent sells maybe 40 to 50 buyer's transactions on my team. And uh, she takes four vacations a year, had a baby and stays with her daughter at home and has a very high quality life. And uh, a few years ago, when I was running seven on my uh, SUV, driving around all over the town, one day I just gave up. I was like, I can't do this. I'm much more useful than taking phone calls and driving around one day, all around all day. And a uh, couple of strategies I used is number one, I came up with three D's in my business. So everything I got to do in my day, I wake up in the morning, I just write it all down or I write it all down a day before. That's the ideal sleep that night. Next morning, I start highlighting them into three things. Dump it, do it, or delegate it. If it's not important and it doesn't move my business forward or my growth forward, I literally move it to the bottom of the list. If I don't get it to it in months or two, it just gets deleted. I mean, it was never important. It was just a creative idea. And the second one is delegate it. This part took me the hardest time because I had a habit of sitting on things because delegation also requires a clean head. Because sometimes, anytime I was copy pasting more than a couple of times, I made sure I hired someone to do it for us. The three days of do it, delegate it, and dump it has gained a lot, has allowed me to gain a lot of time. Now, what I can gain help in, or in, in case in terms of phone calls, anybody who's asking us a question, hey, is this house still available? Doesn't require my expertise to answer. I think anybody who can look up matrix and say it's active can answer that question. So any redundant information, have you received any offers or Anything that a normal person can answer without a real estate license, I made sure I'm not a part of that anymore. And it was a very uh, conscious decision. Like I got tired of it by hitting walls a couple of times. 
Chad, I hope this was helpful. So dump it, delete it, and delegate it. What I can use help today on, Chad, is that by doing so, by time blocking and following it as close to the calendar as possible, there's one thing that bothers me when I get a call from someone. They're like, oh, I'm so glad we're talking today. I know you're very busy. I know I'm very busy, but you and I both know we're busy with the work that they have given us. So I'm making productive. So I'm not sure why it, it challenges my values when somebody calls me busy because I'm truly trying to be available to them. So I would love to know how you guys handle it when people, or is it okay for people to call you busy? I just need a little mindset change on this on how do y'all receive it? when you're following your time block. That's what happened when I started booking things, pushing people to my calendar. And when I changed my voicemail and to me, that's a really good thing because it's like, Hey Rosie, I, I know you're really busy. Thanks for taking my call. That is to me, it's a signal of respect. They're acknowledging I'm grateful for your time. Let's get to it. And I can't think of a better outcome for you. Like I said, what was surprising to me is I didn't lose respect or, or social capital. I gained it. I, you know, I established a boundary and, and it was clear how to still have access to me within those boundaries, but people appreciated my time more and were more complimentary. And okay. so I, I think what it's just your perception of it. I think it's a good thing for you, not a bad thing. So I, I want to go back to your 3D and I want to know when you dump, are you dumping into a catch all? So things don't fall through good ideas, never fall through the cracks. And I, I know that as a visionary, I have literally hundreds upon hundreds of folders and notes of things that I, there's whole businesses in, in my notes that haven't ever been started. And there's just tons. So do you have a catch all or do you just, do you truly purge that and move on? So uh, before we purge it, it sits in this dump it checklist for a few weeks, right? And uh, oftentimes the things that get dumped are the ones that I need to find partnership in and I need to move that project forward or it's just not relevant. In. So what I do is if it is in regards to the business growth, like adding new marketing, like redesigning and picking up the colors for the new logos and I, I have an opinion on it on the end product, but I don't think I'm a candidate to walk through the journey. So sometimes that task gets delayed and delayed. And at some point I have to make a decision that, okay, who do I need to partner up with? Who do I need to hire as an expert and pay someone to make decisions on this? So no, they don't get just deleted forever. They sit in a little pocket and we carefully pick the things that are actually going to move the business forward. Otherwise we just delete it because I don't know, but we are visionary. Your brain is on the go all the time. There's so many ideas that are coming to you and you want to put it down so you can focus on what's important. Uh, and it was a challenge for me to do it. And another thing was challenge for me was emails. Like I read an email. I don't read emails now. How about that? Uh, I glance over it. I look over the keywords and sometimes I tell admin to read it and tell me what's going on. Because if it's too long, I know I'm going to lose focus. So I engage people who are more detail oriented with me. In those. What I have done really well to overcome that is voice notes. So I literally, if there is an email that's important, I need an urgent response. In the morning, I gain four hours a day by delegating properly. So I literally put voice notes on my phone. So my team can understand what I'm saying because I type wrong a lot too. And these are honest mistakes, guys, I make it. So if you see me typing wrong, my fingers move much faster than my brain. And it's sometimes to miss. So I record what I want my team to do. And I tell them two things happen. First, because I'm cutting it short, my team doesn't feel like that I'm being rude. Like sometimes I say, do it. What I'm saying is do it, but they might hear it, do it. So I like to just create those voice notes and send messages on Slack. That's my tool that I use in my team. It's free guys. You can literally, and I screenshot a lot rather than telling what happened. I screenshot the message and I give it to the person and they know what to do next. So I found little shortcuts like that. Voice notes, screenshot, Slack, and it really helps you gain time. So you can do things meaningful. I have four different things that I want to say at the same time swirling through my head. I'm going to start with, we'll go back and we'll finish on your 3D. So on the delegate part, and there's some conversation happening in the chat right now, Rosie, and I think you just elaborated. You probably answered some of those questions, but as far as how the hell do you delegate when you're a solopreneur? What do I do? I can't afford full-time help. And I want to come back to that. But before Rosie answers that, like how you delegate as a, as a early stage entrepreneur or a solopreneur, I want to point you to a book. And this is also in the probate mastery reading list, Dr. Ben Hardy, 
who has a lot of good advice and some really good YouTube videos on time management. And one of the things he does is 10 minutes before bed, when like no electronics for 30 minutes and then 10 minutes before bed, you sit and recap what you got done today, what you didn't get done today and what your priorities are for tomorrow. That's to me, I don't usually offer that kind of advice mainly because my personality doesn't stand up to it as a visionary. I'm like, Nope, that feels too much like disciplined work and the hell with that. I'm not a great meditator. So I, I have my own versions of meditation that are not, it's, it's not like traditional TM, but it's, it works for me. So if you're one of those, if you have like more of an operational, like an ops mindset that, and discipline works for you, for me, it just doesn't like it's, it ends up me criticizing myself because I, did, I ran out of willpower three months in. But Ben Hardy has a book called Who Not How. And for as far as the D, the delegating D in Rosie's 3D, if you haven't read Who Not How, today's the day. Like you, you should go get the book and it will give you ideas. It doesn't specifically say, here's exactly how you find a person to go make phone calls for you or do this or that. It's a higher, it's a macro level conversation about that, about how procrastination and overwhelm oftentimes are signals of success. It's, it means you're doing things right. There's activity in your life. And rather than looking at procrastination as our parents or teachers or anyone else would tell us that it's a bad thing, you just need to, you need to, you know, find your grit and go get it done. Actually, you know, his mentor actually said, suggests that procrastination is, is a really great thing because it's an indication of where your either your time or your skill set's coming up short. And it's a clear indication of what you need to delegate. So if you haven't read Who, Who Not How, I would recommend doing that. So Rosie's really good at leveraging virtual assistants and gig workers to really take her out of those unimportant, urgent tasks that, that are in present in every business. What's your best advice to Dan on that? That's a great question, actually. So Chad is absolutely right. Currently, I have built my team with VAs. But prior to VAs, I had uh, someone in-house that I worked with. And uh, the two things I realized is either I was moving away from pain or I was moving towards pleasure. The few things that I ran towards doing and I felt great. Like one thing I have learned in eight years of my business is that you got to become really in tune with yourself. Because if you're not in tune with yourself, you might find yourself doing busy work and finding yourself productive, but you don't feel fulfilled at the end of the day. So I became very conscious of, okay, what things I do at the end of the day, if I still have 20 more things to do, I'm still walking around feeling like, hey, I did it. So Anything that doesn't make you feel like yet and not fulfilled, that's your item that you need to delve. I, what I do is I'll give you a simple example. Going back to original days, you probably are calling a lot right now. And when you're calling, work creates more work. So when you're calling, you got to have notes. I'm not into notes and stuff, but I need a reference to have a conversation again. So the simple thing you can do is if you are using any kind of dialer, any dialer is coming up with recordings now, right? Mojo dialer has recordings. So what I did is in the beginning, I'll make the phone calls. I'll have my VA upload the list. When I'm done with my dialing at the end of the hour, I want them to hear all my recordings and write down the bullet points of the conversation and set my next follow-up call based on my day. I got out of that management system. So I only did what I enjoyed. So uh, to answer your question, as a solopreneur, your paperwork and your busy work after prospecting is probably consuming most of your day. And when I say paperwork, it means writing an offer. And if we all think about it, offers literally are nine pages on a contract. And we, we all know we write the same thing again and again. And I have actually come up with a checklist, not a checklist, I have my team come up with a checklist. I give them ideas and they come up with a checklist. I basically tell them, hey, this much earnest money, this much price, this is the title company, appraisal waiver. So once you slow down and think what you really do and come up with those 12 items you're constantly doing again and again, Next time, you will spend less than five minutes on it and you will acquire 30. So to answer your question, look at the things that bog you down and hire a VA. And where you go about VAs, VAs are everywhere. You want to know how I hired my first VA? I got so tired of work and next morning I was getting ready. I was like, God, give me an answer. I don't want to wake up and do this today. And some email came to me about VAs for help. And I just called them and got connected. And since then... I have built a VA. Right now, we have five active VAs and one part-time VA producing agents in the front. 
So go online. There is Philippines uh, VA Facebook group. You can go to Pam's Consultancy. Once you go into these two resources on Google, you will have so many other. And these are my primary the areas I go to look for VAs. Where, where are you in the country? Oh, I'm in Austin, Texas. Austin, Texas. That's like right. Oh, 21 Selma Hughes Drive. That was our old place. Let me know when you want to visit your old place. Thank you. Uh, I, I appreciate that. Yeah. The VA stuff, it's, it's, it's difficult to find a good VA, right? So it's like finding a good girlfriend or a good boyfriend, right? Sometimes you got to go through a little bit to find one that, that just clicks and works and it can be frustrating. But once you go through the pain of finding that person and you can hand the stuff off and know it's done. Great. I, if I could find someone that I just give this stuff to and I know it's done. Great. I would add something to that. And this is probably going to, uh, you guys are very dear to me and I promise not to show up any less than authentic with y'all. So this is probably going to sound harsh what I'm about to say next. I have heard that a lot, even before I hired VAs, but I always chose to make things my experiential truth. If VAs are hard to maintain, I want to know it for myself why they're really hard. Here's why I'll tell you they are hard. You're working with an employee who doesn't understand your culture. They're really hardworking people. They don't want to let you down, okay? They want the job. So can we agree like they need the job and you have a job opportunity. So that part is satisfied. But what we fail to overlook is we overnight want somebody to be our replacement, right? And that is a lot of expectation for someone who's willing to work for four or $5 an hour a job. We cannot expect people to replace us overnight. We first of all become, must become very clear about what is it that we need help with. Because anytime things don't work out, there are only two things that were wrong. Either the system failed or the skill failed. So before I pointed the finger at myself or at the other person, I first went to the system and said, so you failed to do this task because you didn't understand me right? Or is our communication system wrong? So I do a lot of Zoom calls and I would share with you like in last year and a half, since I have really established my VA team, there, there has not been a single day that I missed my team meeting. And the reason I don't miss my team meeting is not because I enjoy it. I honestly don't enjoy it. I don't want to show up, but I know the amount of time and the movement I make. By, so I dedicate 30 minutes to the operations team, which is all VA team. I have one person just handling phone. I have one person just doing listing transactions. I have one person just doing leases because I have investors who buy with us and they want us to rent it. So she runs all my leases, like without my, any involvement now. I only get to see the final uh, result at the end. And there's one person who is just uploading clean sheets, downloading clean sheets, dialing and just sending emails and marketing and whatever needs to be done. So I made one thing, the one thing for everyone. So I have clarity. When I go to this person in Slack, I'm only talking about leases. I'm only talking about investments. So you got, but these buckets really helped me. So I would say when you work with VAs, see if you can emphasize on systems and skill before we be hard on ourselves that we are not doing a good job at hiring or we're not finding right people. And between these two, you would be surprised how much they're willing to do for you. I had people who were willing to work at Memorial Day for me and they're like, because I took some time off and I needed help that Monday. And they actually volunteered to work. They didn't have to do it. So they're very giving people. They're very culturally kind. And I think it takes time to understand them and use them. Yeah. So I, to, to summarize, Dan, and she just gave you the nicest smackdown you've ever had. Like, it's not the VAs. <laughs> yeah, no, I know. I've used the VAs before. And I know a girl who ran, really, ran her whole business, built the thing, and the whole damn thing ran with VAs. Yeah. And but she was a drill sergeant. She was very disciplined and she was very structured. She worked for Dell. Like she was a manager there. She was a hard hitter. My personality is a little bit more laid back than that. So for me, it's, I need to get more structure. Yeah, maybe so you they, get out of structure and they manage all your views for you. A couple of things that, that I wanted to, to circle back to the four things that were swirling around my head. This is an amazing conversation. Thank you, Rosie. One of the things that I did that I forgot about or take for granted. Like when I first hired my, I chose not to hire a virtual assistant. I chose to hire locally because I wanted to be able to use her for, yeah. instead of me going to a home inspection or me going to a, we have what's inflow and infiltration, like a, the water authority, we have a mandatory inspection. There's there, they always pass. Like it's just someone has to show up. And so I wanted to be able to have local services from that, that employee as well as, as virtual. So before, like when I made the decision, 
decision to hire. I was processing all alone as a solopreneur. I was running about eight, 14 transactions a month is what I was averaging when I finally made that decision. It was eating me alive because just like Rosie said, work begets more work. And it was just every day that I did a better job. I had more damn work to do the next day. Yeah. So what I would do is I would go home in the evenings. I had developed checklists for everything. So I came out of, if you remember, I came out of resort real estate. Like we were spoiled as hell. We worked for a developer. We had a big office on kind of Poly beach. I drank beer and made friends with millionaires. That was what I did for a living. And everyone else did the transaction management and all the busy work. Like I was fortunate enough to, to be in that environment. However, I got my ass handed to me when I stepped into your all's world. When I came into residential real estate, I'm like, holy smokes, there's a million moving parts. So I very quickly moved to systematize everything in my business. So a buyer appointment had a checklist, a, a buyer contract had a checklist, a seller phone call yeah. had a checklist, a seller appointment had a checklist, a listing upload had a checklist, a listing marketing had a checklist. And these are all things I literally just opened an Excel spreadsheet, put in, put a, made a little checkbox and made it where it would print on one page and I would adjust the format and the fonts. So I had all these checklists to keep myself on track. What was fascinating, amazing to me is when I started working with the local title companies, I sent closing instructions and I, I sent the checklist. So it was literally proved that everything on this transaction had been done in a linear fashion. They were blown away. They're like, there's 3000 real estate agents around here and we've never had anyone do anything like this. And I'm like, I don't have fucking time for you to be chasing me on the phone. If I drop, if something falls through the crack, you shouldn't have to be chasing me. I should have caught it. So the checklist is the first thing. If you can document every process in your business or the lack thereof, it will show you where some of your time is being wasted or where you're not being as efficient. Now I took that to the next level when I decided to hire an assistant and I'm like, how the hell am I going to train an assistant? I was literally working 16, 18 hour days, seven days a week. I was processing over 150 transactions alone as a solopreneur. It was eating me alive. So I'm like, how in the hell am I going to train this person? Like I have the revenue, I have the money, but it's, and, and this is, you you guys might've heard me talk about the, the, the metaphor of I was riding a lion. So it looks sexy as hell from the outside. But I knew the first time I had to pee, I was stepping off that lion's back and he would buckle around and eat me. So it was, I, I was in a conundrum there. What I did is I, I took every time I would do one of those checklists or a buyer's agreement or a listing agreement or a purchase agreement, everything that I did for about a three week period was screenshot uh, recorded on my laptop. And I didn't know who I was talking to. A job application hadn't been posted. But in the course of my normal business, I just started to document my daily processes. Here's how I manage my email inbox. Here's how I put leads into the CRM. Here's how I review a contract and present the offer to the seller. Here's how we fill out pre-fill listing agreement before appointment. Here's how we do a preliminary title search to make sure that this short sale is, is you know, not messier than we think. And it was, it, it, I literally just made video after video. And at night, when things calmed down at two o'clock in the morning, I would upload those into a YouTube playlist. And then I would go, I created assistant, C-R-E-A assistant at gmail.com. I would take the YouTube video link. I would go into the calendar of this future mystery person who I hadn't even posted the job for. And I would say buyer contract training. And it would be a three, however long that video was is how long that block was. So over a three week period, I booked 60 days of intensive virtual training using nothing but YouTube and Google calendar. And when Stacy, so Stacy was her name, she moved from Iowa. She was running a, an REO department. She was responsible for about 110 REOs at a time. So she was the right person to, to thrive in that environment. I literally gave her Gmail username and password and said, I'm sorry, but I'm not going to be here to train you personally. Let me know if you ever need any input. In 60 days, she never once said, I don't know how to do this because there were checklists and Dropbox folders. There were YouTube videos linked in the calendar and little, I know it's a long story, but there's little things like that that I've taken for granted how I was able to get myself out of that damn mess because it was, it, it, it felt impossible at the time. But I just, there's little things like that that you can start to document the processes, how you do it, why you do it that way. Audio recordings, video recordings, get it in 
into a calendar. And that's where back to the VA and the cultural differences, the biggest challenges, and Rosie, you hit the nail on the head. It's a, it's an amazing insight. Like we have unrealistic expectations for people who really have not been conditioned and trained in our culture and our business culture. It's very different. Imagine hiring a Spanish VA, like that would be a nightmare. Wouldn't it? It's like, what do you mean you're going to sleep for three hours? It's two o'clock. But, but th these people are extremely hard workers. It's, we have to take accountability as leaders. And if they're following short, we need to look inward and say, what the hell did I, what could I have done to help that person to, to a better set them up for success? So those are just some pointers from things that actually worked for me, where I was able to just in the course of normal build, business, build a library, corporate training videos. And that's back to the email. E myth revisited is probably where I picked that up. I always strive to have a franchise prototype and document the processes in the business. And surprisingly, that that helped me train Stacy. Now, all that said, if you don't want to do this, there is a company called My Outdesk. You might you're probably aware of them if you you worked with VAs. Daniel Ramsey's a friend of mine. He he's the founder of that company. He literally built a family in the Philippines. So he goes in and builds big facilities. He treats these people like, like he treats them with respect and dignity and pours his soul into them. And there's no surprise why he's been as successful as he is because yeah. he actually cares about that cultural difference. And it's important to him that he creates good careers for these people, not shitty VA gigs. So if you're, if it's time and you're ready to commit to at least 20 hours a week, you will not find a better managed group of employees that will stay with you forever. But you've got to be at a position in your business where you can bite off a minimum block for it to make sense because Daniel's protecting their culture. And his stance is, I'm going to make sure I create a career for this person. And to have somebody say, well, you, I'll try him out for five hours this week and maybe three hours next month. He, he's protecting his, the, the family he's built. He's protecting from that. So if you're at a certain level where if you have 15 to 20 man hours a week uh, at least, then my help desk is, is, is I can't give them a better endorsement. Like I, I know Daniel personally, he's a great man. He treats his people well and the rates vary based on the skill set. but they, they're pretty heavy in real estate. The, the vast majority of, of their virtual assistants are trained in real estate, but they go through linguistics training. They go through inflection training, like how do like cultural, the idioms and the things that us Americans use and they work us hours. So if you don't want to tackle that mastering that skill set, like Rosie is Rosie's chosen the DIY method, which is commendable. It's hard. It's, it's a lot of work and they VAs come and go. People poach them off of you. When they find out you've got one that's, that's doing well in the real estate space and, and they find out they can make an extra $3 an hour. You don't even know there's a problem until they quit answering your emails. And that's the constant, that's a huge pain in the ass, but my help desk will alleviate some of those problems. Like having the training, the cultural training and the, and the English, like English with barely any accent, managing the, the HR components of that, the payments, the, a lot of the ins and outs. So if you have that much work, that's my suggestion is, is give, give, give my help desk a call. There's Daniel and I, there's some stuff on YouTube where he and I went long form and talked about this and, and what it looks like to use a VA through my help desk. If you search, if you go to YouTube and do Chad Corbett, Daniel Ramsey, or my help desk, you can probably find that interview, but uh, man, so many good pointers in here from, this is a good conversation. This is stuff that I don't know. We've thought about theming these calls, but if we do, it's like, well, we have really have uncovered that. I don't think most people have systems in place that are repeatable. I think most of us are single unit people and mm -hmm. it, it's like a thrash to get the next deal where uh, I don't have enough systems in place to give them the training or, or I, I don't have, I don't have some repeatable process to give them. I have all these odds and ends things to give them. And I, I agree. It's, I know they want to work hard. I, I don't doubt that by any means, but my message isn't clear to them. So Dan, can you make a commitment to everybody here that you'll start to document your business processes? You'll come up with checklists and, and just start to, let me issue this in the form of a challenge. Let's find, let's, I'm trying to make this not depressing. I don't want to make you terminally ill. Let's <laughs> say you, you won a, a six month trip where you get to travel the world. Ritz Carlton just issued you a six month trip, all expenses, but you have to accept in the next seven days. Can you get your business processes documented where they're duplicatable by a capable person 
in the next seven days, can you at least document what it is you do in the business? So what is your job description? What do you do? What do other people do? What are like, and I think if you can get in that mindset and connect with that exercise, if I was going to travel the world for six months without a cell phone and I had seven days to prepare, how in the hell would I do that and still have this business be alive when I come back? Interesting story. When I cut Stacy loose, when she finished the last block on her training calendar, I was getting, I, I literally put seven deals in escrow in one day. And I was doing, I was ratifying contracts as I got on an airplane to fly into Northern Canada. And 18 days later, I came out of the woods and I was like, I wonder if it burnt to the ground. Cause I literally just relied on the calendar and YouTube, the trainer. And I was up till four o'clock in the morning and I flew out at six. I laid down for two hours because I, I ratified seven contracts in a day from start to finish. And I was just, I was hit. And, and so when I came back, I, I called the title company first. And I'm like, Hey, can you tell me like, how bad is it? She's amazing. I love her. Can we like just work with her and you get the hell out of our way? I'm like, yes, it worked. So I, I didn't even think of that when I, I challenged you with the exercise, but I lived that. Like I literally trained her and disappeared for almost three weeks and came back. She did not drop a single ball and we closed. I think we had 14 closings while I was gone and she was at the closing table. Like she went there and greeted my clients and the, like the title companies loved her from that moment on. But there's a lot of good, we've thrown a lot at you, but I think if you can just, and maybe it's not a seven day commitment, maybe it's over the next 30 days. If you can commit to just forcing your, not forcing yourself, but challenging yourself to document those processes, whether it's in writing on video However, you might do that, you'll start to see some of your own blind spots, I think, and where you really need help. The next thing I would encourage you to do is once you've done that, go by and put a check mark beside of everything you hate, everything you don't enjoy doing, the things that are urgent but not important. That becomes your job description. And that might be the job description of one person or four people, but regardless, they're the things that you need to get rid of because you're not, you're, they're keeping you from dollar productive activity. So the exercise is twofold. One, it helps become a training manual, your franchise prototype. Two, it becomes a job description for your key hire. So I, I think it's, for me, it's probably a three-part process, Chad, because looking at it this way, I don't have enough, I don't have a repeatable day. I don't have repeatable processes that, and that's my fault. I don't have enough of a structure to hand that off to somebody. Yep. And I, 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 that's a bad thing for me to admit, but I'm sure there's other guys on this thing in the same boat. We've all been in your position. If anyone on here says they haven't, that means they haven't really, they haven't been successful enough. You haven't gotten your ass handed to you yet. You'll get there. We all will. None of us are immune to this. It's just, it's a muscle. We just have to learn how to build it. And it's a little different for all of us. I, I'll go back to Rosie, I think was the one that recommended the E-Myth. It sounds to me, having talked this conversation through a little bit more, that suggestion is even better than it was when she made it. I think you're going to get a ton from that book. The, the, if you like, do you like audio books, Dan? That's the only kind I can read. <laughs> Michael Gerber, actually, I think he self-narrated that one. He has a George Carlin voice. It's a really pleasant audio book to listen to. But uh, yeah, yeah, that's, that one's investor specific. I don't think I've read that one. I've read the original multiple times. Like I, That's one of those books that I revisit. All right. You've got the whole library, man. Oh, sorry, go ahead. I was going to ask, those look like pretty crisp copies. Are, are you using the osmosis method or are you actually? See, see, that's some of the issue. There's so many things that I need to do. Sometimes you're just like, okay, I, I want to do this, but wait a minute. I'm not really prepared. I have to do this. And then you're just yes. in this cycle of chasing my tail. Is your income where you want it to be? Oh, no, nowhere near. Oh, my, nowhere income near. Is a, my income is a dwindling Schwab account. That's what my income is. Do you have high months and low months or is it you're just living on savings right now? Yeah, I do okay, I, but I'm really new. I, I'm really new in this business. I was a tech guy for 30 years, and this is a whole different game. It is, for sure. But the good news about you being a tech guy is you have an operational mind, right? Like, you don't recoil from those things. I do. Like, I can make myself do it in, in sprints. So I can make myself be an ops guy 30, 60, 90 days at a time. But eventually, I'm like, ah! I got to run away to the woods and camp by myself for months. But so you, what I would, I want you to focus on the urgency and the importance of getting foundational systems in place in your business. And I would say, having had this conversation, reading that book, 
like seriously reading it with a highlighter in hand and notes. And when you get inspired, when you have an idea, put the book down, write that down and come back to it. I did this in 20, but before the story of, of documenting each and every little process and making YouTube videos, I did it. I remember clearly it was New Year's Day. I was home alone. I chose not to do anything on New Year's Eve or, or and I kept that day open for just planning and clarity for the start of a new year. And this was, that was the same year, right before I went to Tony Robbins UPW the first year. But I, I sat down with E-Myth Revisited by the fireplace and I committed to reading it cover to cover in one day. It took me almost 16 hours because I had so many ideas and so many just, just flashes of inspiration. This was the second or third time through the book. It still, it usually takes me six to seven hours to read a, a business book cover to cover. It took me almost uh, over twice that time, but it was, it, it locked in the lessons that I didn't hear the first time. I didn't notice the first time. And it's, it, the reason I was so thorough that time is frankly, because it fucking mattered more than ever. And I was living off of savings. I didn't have the revenue that I needed. I, like I had revenue, but my net was terrible. I was spending more, too much of the revenue I was earning and it mattered. And right now it sounds like it matters in, in your situation. So I, I would, if you can commit to whether it's that or something else, but you've got those books and you've heard our suggestions on how, how much of a difference they were able to make for us. I would think that's the most important thing you can do in your business right now is lay down that foundation where you do have, a, you are clear on what needs to be done on a daily basis. You know what the rhythm is. Then you will begin to learn how to, you can delegate that and the parts you hate and the parts you love and the parts you want to celebrate. And like Rosie said, those are the ones you want to keep. The rest of them become job descriptions, delegation. But if there's, we've put you on the, in the hot seat and hammered at you, but I would say that's the most important thing you can do in the next month is really focus on whether it's the e-myth or some other system. There's one more thing. Gino Wickman wrote a book called Traction and there's a parable version called Get a Grip. And that teaches the entrepreneurial operating system or EOS. These books are also in the probate mastery reading list. That has been like the next evolution moving away from Google Calendar and away from, from the, the, that first iteration of things that helped me get my processes in place. The next iteration of that, when all the leads began, was moving that over to the EOS, the Entrepreneurial Operating System. And there's a piece of software that, that I still use, and I probably should own stock in this company as much, many people as I sell it to, but I just dropped in the chat. There's a 30-day trial. I, this is, I'm not an affiliate. I just grabbed that off the Google result. But that will help you rein in the, the daily, monthly, quarterly, and annual activities. And when you read the e-myth, what you're going to, one of the biggest takeaways for me from that is you need to visualize who you are 10 years from now, what your business looks like 10 years from now, and then start to document your way back and you create, right? And that's what, that's the fun part about business. And it's hard when you're in the state that you're in right now. It's, yeah, I don't want to be creative. I want to make some damn money. I got to pay bills, but Give yourself the space like that to, to tap into that creative genius and, and look out there 10 years and then come back. And a good place to capture that, the best place I've found is not in Dropbox, not in a million different Word documents. The 90.io software has really helped me keep all that. And Rosie, back to all the way back to the, when you first began talking, one of the questions I asked you about dumping your last D, the dump. What I use is you have long-term and short-term issues, they, as, as they're called within the software and within the EOS. And what I use long-term issues for is the catch-all. So when something, a short-term issue is the things that need to be talked about on a weekly meeting, and each of those should be dispositioned off and there shouldn't be anything left there. Anything that the disposition is what you're talking about, delegate, do, do or dump. And you, dis you either delegate to another team member, you delegate to yourself and do it, or you dump it into the long-term issues. So that way it's never lost. There's always a record there of your best ideas and inspirations. And so oftentimes you'll come back in six months and be like, that was a stupid freaking idea. I'm glad we didn't spend time on that. But then you can always delete the 4D, right? So you can dump. And then, so I, I guess I use like the 4D, like delegate, do, 
the dump or delete would be the way I use that system. But that's something that as you jump into this, Dan, it, it may be helpful to start that free trial of 90.io. And as your vision develops for what your business looks like and what those processes are, all of that is documentable right inside of that software. Without the software, EOS is almost impossible to keep up with. There's no amount of discipline. And I've watched hundreds of guys go through this and I end up being like, that's why I said that made the joke about 90 because I've helped so many guys get their bit like small to medium sized businesses up to 25, 30 million bucks, help them get everything back on track and rein in the chaos by using that software. So it's, it's just a simple tool. It's $12 per user, but it's worth its weight in gold. So that's my last piece of advice. And I know Ronald and Eric and Justin have been waiting to, uh, to jump in. Eric, I, I interrupted you earlier. I'll start with you. I actually just wanted to see if, if Rosie might be willing to have a, a conversation just about how she does some training with her ISAs, just about culture. Because I think one thing that I've really identified is my guy's too polite at times. He's too apologetic. He's not brash or abrasive or rude, but he's definitely a little bit apologetic at times, I feel. So I just want to know if she might be willing to have a conversation, even if it's not today, but offline sometime. I'll go ahead and speak for her. Her rate is $1,500 an hour. It runs through my Stripe account. That's fine. I'd pay it. I love it. I love that chat. Thank you. You're absolutely right. They are very polite and they are very, like, sometimes they're very timid in terms of they don't want to say that they didn't get it, right? So one of the cultural things that when I hire people, you know, in addition to understanding their skill set, I'm not too attached to what they know, but how they do things. Like that has been my consistent theme in hiring people. My buyer's agent was such a top producer right now, in my opinion, it's, she's doing really well for herself. She was leaving the real estate. If we can change our mindset, maybe try trying it in your personal life, in your business, rather than hiring someone on what they do, what they have done, maybe more attached to how they are going about things. And if that is in fit with your personality and business. So that's number one thing I did with VA. I asked them, how would you go about if something like this happens? So a lot of those questions were asked when I interviewed them. And uh, another question I asked them is that in your career, what has been an ideal supervisor for you? Like, when did you feel most productive and most growing and most joyous at your work? And I figured out, I wrote down those traits for those people. And consistently across the board, all of these gave me one response. They said they had zero to little interaction with their main person who hired them. And they just didn't know if they were doing well oh. or what was truly needed. And uh, I'm a visual person. I, my audio book kind of flies over my head. I have to read something. So I actually, to be honest with you, I don't even talk to my VA if they are not on a Zoom call on a video. So I have all my VAs on video. I want to see the cringe or the timidness. I want to see the body language when I see something, how you receive it. And uh, that really gave, get, gave me a lot of leverage always doing a video call with them and screen share and showing them because yes. how do we know are they kinesthetic are they more visual are they more auditory like uh, the best my best liberation has been it is not important that people know what i want get done it was more important to me that i know how the people i hired get things done because then i can navigate my business properly so uh, this really helped me to do a Zoom video call and asking a lot of how questions on what has been their best experience when they felt fully trained and fully useful on a team. So when you find those core qualities and you're willing to foster the talent and say, they may not have strong sales skills, but they've got a really, they've got these core qualities that really may work well with you. And you're like, this person can be trained over time. So it's not so much about just finding somebody who's super strong in sales, but finding somebody who may have a good customer service background or knows how to reroute the conversation and kind of get it back in. Yes, that's right. And Eric, uh, you and I both know that in our business, the highest dollar producing activity is having a conversation or moving a, a transaction forward. Like if somebody yes. is on a fence, we move that forward. Or if somebody has been a prospect, you, the fact that I hear the word right in you and I can tell that fires you too. So I, I think the highest dollar producing activity on my clock, I want it to be dedicated the last in the row. First, I want to delegate all the minimum wage activities. The reason I want to do that is so that I can become more dollar productive per hour. So the sales part was not even my expectations. I said, you don't have to sell a single thing. I want you to do everything but sales. Because more time I had to my, 
The reason we don't like lead generation is because all the people who are creeping up in the back of our head is scaring. Then the moment I'm going to put this phone down, I have to attend to all those monkeys that I have been jumping on my emails and on my phones. Sure. But if somebody is yeah. keeping that down, I found myself having fun with prospecting. All I want to do is just talk to people and make deals. But having this and that is where we forget what we are hiring people for. My biggest, the two things, somebody I was really inspired by in real estate, I always watch people who are very bigger producers than me. And I always try to reach out to them and see how they respond. They will always answer my important question, but if I'm just checking on them, they didn't respond. It means they're busy doing their thing. So I always like to uh, mimic them. And there was two things that someone told me, I forgot the second thing now, but I won't remember the one. He said, I went to that, my great friend, Andy, I said, Andy, you do so well for yourself. Like, I know what are the right things to do, but I'm not able to do it. He said, that's not important enough to you yet. The day it becomes important enough to you, you will figure it out. So it became so important for me to figure it out with the V that I had to figure out how these people work best so I can plug my system to it. And Walmart is a big, and guys, I know Walmart is hated and all those things are, McDonald's are hated. And, but what we are hating is our opinion about it. But if in essence, we look at it from far away, they're running good businesses. It is much harder to find high quality talent because the high quality talent is going to want to learn, grow, and move. And that's the best compliment a high performing talent can give you, right? For high performing talent to survive, our world has to be big enough so their world can exist within us. When we are working with VAs, they can be average talent, but if you give them a sharp system, they can look like high performers. The word that I use to describe about something becoming important, I use the word conviction. Until it becomes a strong conviction in my heart, it's not yeah. going to be front and center. So that like literally summarized my question at the very beginning of the call. I need to be more convicted of what my non-negotiables are. Yeah. And it sounds like it's just prospecting and building processes for everything that might fall to the wayside, but still has to be accomplished. So that's my big takeaway. Yes. Thank you. And the second thing, I just remembered it. So the second thing was... I learned it from Chris Voss, actually, Chad, you have brought his name quite a few times. I love, but I have gotten a lot of opportunity to meet Chris Voss, Brandon Voss, and Derek uh, Gaunt at a couple of events. And uh, they told me one thing, they said, never be so attached to an outcome that you won't take anything better along the way. So I never get attached to what idea I started the business with because I've been a victim of that. As business and entrepreneur, entrepreneurs, we think that if I set the vision uh, and if I change the vision, what are people going to think about me? I thought about that all the time. And one day I was like, you know what? Now I know more. Maybe I want something better. So I'm the first one to tell my team, I don't know what I'm about to say, but you guys are better at building systems. So hear me out and tell me what I should be doing. And, uh, and Chris Voss made it very simple for me. He said, the smartest person in the room is the person who knows how to use everybody's brain. So I shut up and I let my team talk because then my team knows what they think matters. And more you empower them, uh, more powerful they will make you. Thank you. Saw, Eric, I've already emailed you the invoice, so I'll be sure and pay that. <laughs> Thank you, Chad. I appreciate that one. All right, Ronald, you're up next. Thank you. I've got a question for you, Chad. And just to give the question a little context, I'll let you know that I, or remind you that I became an agent in January and no income. I've been living off of savings for months. Finally, we're getting our first listing. We've been working on this particular property for more than a month, trying to get everything together. We're signing the listing today. That'll be our, our first deal going forward. I'm excited about that. No, is this, is that one a probate? That's a probate deal. Yep. Great. And it was through an attorney referral. I was excited about that. Then I met with another attorney, bought his lunch on Thursday of last week. I told you coming up, I've got this thing I'm excited about. So he promised that he was going to refer somebody to me. I've referred somebody to him already. It's starting to happen. My, right. my question though, my, my issue here is that I am, have not had any success in prospecting. I'm hardly ever able to get a hold of anybody on the phone. When I do get somebody on the phone, it uh, seems like it's, I'm too late. Like I've had people tell me, hey, I, I closed on that deal three weeks ago. Very active kind of market. Uh, wholesalers are hugely active out here. 
And I know that I need to get better at the prospecting side, if only to get people that I can refer to my attorneys to begin those relationships, because those are where my deals are coming from right now is from the attorneys. I'm in Phoenix, my partner's in Tucson. And are you buying leads? So we're buying leads in Tucson from all the leads. And for this market, I'm buying from another vendor. I'm okay. buying both probate leads and pre-probate leads. Your advice to me on the last call was to get the email addresses and to try to do Facebook retargeting ads, which I have started doing now, but I'm not you sure. Figured out that you got the skip trace done. So you, yeah. you got the email address. Okay. And have you figured out how to make the saved audience or the custom audience? I've done all of that. So of the, let's see, I had on the pre-probate leads, I got about 125 in Maricopa County and about 125 in Pinell County of those 250, I had a, about 650 relatives who had emails. Okay. So I put those into the, into the thing and started doing those ads with a custom audience. Okay. Um, and what was, what's your, what's the creative for your ad? Is it a photo, a video? It's a video of me just talking about the services that I provide, okay. helping people go through probate and deal with the personal property and all of that. And how long so has that been, how long is it running and what's your daily budget? So the video itself is 33 or 34 seconds. It's only been running about four days and it's 20 bucks a day. Okay. And what's your cost per impression? What's the CPI on it? I don't know. It's, I, I don't know. I'd have to. Okay. What's that. the call to action in the video and the ad um, copy? It is to learn more and it sends them to the, to my website. Okay. And what page does it land on? The first page. Okay. And what's the call to action on that homepage? There is a... A place where they can push a button and dial my phone but now you're telling me i should get rid of my phone <laughs> but at this point it's not a problem I, i'll take any call i can get no you can absolutely do both i'm saying when you've got when you need to guard your time then it's time to remove your phone number but it's not time now I've... So one of the methods that i like is leave your phone number on the top header of your website and they can always find find your phone number but the call to action is your Calendly link, right? So they go in, they yeah. choose a time that works for them, but always give them the option to call right now if they want to, as long as you have the bandwidth or you have somebody that you've delegated that to. For me, I was really interested in creating the expectation that I don't jump and, and I'm not always there, but I get that doesn't work for everybody. The one thing I would like you to do is build a, are you on a WordPress? Are you you're using one of the all the lead sites or? It's so you can build a page that's not in deck. It's not in the menu. Just put in domain.com forward slash community resource, whatever that might be. And on your Facebook ad, have it land on that page. And on that page, you're going to have a subsequent video because they're not going to learn. They're not, 35 seconds is not long enough for them to trust you. It's right. long enough. It, it's long enough. You get the interruption. They can identify with it. Then they click. The next step is let's get them on a landing page where you go long for them and you talk about your the, the social enterprise that you're offering, why you're doing that, what value that, that you can bring to the families, give some examples, give them ways where they can learn more about you. Hey, guys, there's an about page right here. I encourage you to go look at that. You'll find more information about me on Yelp or Trulia or Zillow or you know wherever Google reviews, wherever you can point them to. But give them permission to do their due diligence on you and like that will build trust but that if that traffic's hitting your home page and you're not getting conversions you're not getting calls it's probably because they don't it's not clear enough what you're doing so let's we can use your wordpress site let's just land them on a specific landing page off of your when you on the, the url from from the ad and let's land them there and give them a more detailed video that tells them more and excuse me, and that should increase your conversions. The call to action, put it right below the video. Hey guys, my name is Ronald. Thanks so much for clicking the ad. As you know by now, I specialize in helping families in probate. And yes, I do have the courage to put myself on social media because it's so important to me that I actually reach as many families as I can in Maricopa. I realize there's a lot of folks out there with different intent. So thank you for your patience. I'm sure you want to learn more about what we do. If you'd like to call me right now, whether that's to cuss me out or tell me that this is amazing, this is in the community, there's a number above, or you can schedule yourself into my calendar below. If you've got a few minutes, stick around. I'll tell you a little bit about what we do, why we do it, and how we built this.
and then go into your pitch and a really a casual video like that gives them permission to critic be critical of you they're not going to but something like that casual really will help them go oh this guy's human and he's actually in maricopa this is pretty interesting i'll stay here for another three minutes and then remember go back to your call to action so if you've made it this far in a video, obviously you're thinking maybe you could use a little help. The easiest way to reach me because we do help so many families and I do have conversations every day with families all over this massive county of ours. But the easiest way to reach me is go ahead and schedule into the calendar right now or call the number at the top of the page. If I can't get you, I'll, if you miss me, I'll make sure I, you get a return call by the end of the day. But thanks so much for visiting our page and please let us help you. And something like that. And in, in three minutes, like you can take it. If you're not getting the conversations on the phone, but you are getting some engagement with that, let's sell on a landing page. So that would be my advice there. The other advice is the same as last week, man. Focus on those attorneys. Like you are in one of the most tenaciously competitive markets in the country. So you've got to focus on those X factor things like this. So building, organically building relationships with attorneys, doing, you know, using social media and other methods that other people aren't cracking into. The, and, and I forgot that you're mixing pre-probate in there too. You may even soften that message on the video. You may say, listen, we understand that some people don't know what, what the first step is. And that's why it's important that we reach out and we get mm -hmm. that this is contentious and this may be reaching you at a time where you're still grieving. However, uh, just know the wolves are coming and we can either work for you or we can help protect you from that. You may go with a message like that because you're even upstream of the probate filing. Yeah, that's the goal is to get upstream so that I can help direct them to the attorneys I want to strengthen relationships with. I just got to figure out how to do that. So if I'm, you don't want me to call the pre-probate leads, you want me to, but I can call the probate leads. Yeah, probate is they've appointed themselves or they've been appointed as a public representative. So they're, they, sh they should be willing to talk. Otherwise, they're assigned. The pre probate is contentious and you can try it. It's your reputation to risk. I'm not going to hammer that list because you don't know who the decision maker is. You don't know if the estate is ready to be sold, if the siblings are all positioning to hire attorneys and sue each other and you call one you might be walking in the middle of a damn litigation mess there's just so much uncertainty in in a pre-probate scenario it could who you never know and the risk you run there is you become that guy right like you you call the family members you, that that one family member tells the other five and those five go and get out their poison pens and troll you on the internet and leave you bad google reviews and some of that shit can't be undone so you can do reputational harm by, by a lot of people think be there first and who cares what they think. But in today's day and age, if you're building a digital reputation, it can be taken from you in seconds. Yeah. So that's why I'm so cautious to support anyone calling these folks with probate. They're in a different mindset They're They've, they've processed to an extent they've processed the loss. They've moved forward, gone to the courthouse, scheduled an appointment, gone to the courthouse, sat down, talked to the clerk. And now they have an expectation that there's going to be some inbound from creditors. There's going to be some inbound. They, they have responsibilities. But in pre-probate, that expectation is not there yet. They're still like, I don't know what to do. What are we going to do about this? One of the things, like if you want to specialize in pre-probate, a, a very valuable offer that you could offer on that social media campaign, if you can get a, pro, a probate attorney or an estate planning attorney, if you can get them to co-author, even if it's just a 10 page ebook, something that, that a legal professional in the county can co-author with you. you. So you've recently lost a loved one. Here's the life transition checklist. And, it, and it's here's, here's how do you like, and talk about things. What do you do about their passwords, their email account, their online bills, their cell phone, their things like this. Talk, don't talk about real estate. Talk about early in the process the things that are right in front of them that are glaringly like that are saying, holy shit, where did she, wh like, where does the phone bill even go? It didn't show up. And now they're like, or the, the electric bill and they're going to shut the electric off and it's 125 degrees and the cat's still in the house and we're going by there feeding it every day. Like those more immediate problems that are, that, that start to occur to them right after the death. Those are the kind of things that it's most valuable to help them address because they're in this kind of panic mode a lot of times. So if you can get an attorney to, to help you co-author a piece like that, that could be the offer in, on your landing page or maybe even in the Facebook ad. Click here for a, a family, tran Maricopa family transition uh, 
PDF or whatever that might be. I've done a great creative job here, but I think you get the idea. I've if, thought you know, about that kind of thing before. My concern, though, is if I align myself with one particular attorney, does that mean some of the other attorneys that I want to have relationships with won't refer to me? So do it as a, like you be the author and go to each attorney and ask them for collaboration and just say, listen, I've, I'm adding attorneys to my team. Would you like to comment and, and have a citation in this? And in the end of it, you could have 10 attorneys. Like this is a huge thanks to the estate planning attorneys of Maricopa County. Here are all the contributors to this piece. And just it, it's, there's lots of books like, so you can, it can be a collective knowledge piece from you and 10 different attorneys. And you guys, they have a choice at the end of that, if they got value from it. And maybe you give each attorney a chapter, maybe you write a damn book and one attorney writes a chapter on preparing on, on guardianship and another writes a chapter on this and another on that. But that way everybody gets, gets to contribute and gets credit and they have their own little piece of piece of the piece, piece of the PDF. But that's a longer term thing. It's not something you're going to get in place this week, but it's something to think about. Take that idea and run with it. What if I had a, a valuable resource for folks who are pre-probate, who have just lost a family member? What if I have a CPA write a chapter, a funeral home director write a chapter, a somebody from the bill, the collection department at the phone company or the water utility? Like here's how, here's if in a perfect world, here's what families should know about paying the last utility bill or making sure utilities get transferred, not shut off. Just think of all those people in the community really early in the process that can offer good advice to this family, go out, document their best advice, bring it back and you take credit. You put your name on the cover. That's pretty good, Chad. Yeah. The one thing I would say, like I did that article, I, you can go out and get one written for you and then ask for their opinion to edit it. That's a really good idea. You could put, that's a really good idea, Chad. Wow. Yeah. I figured I'd say something. Yeah. Appreciate it. Ronald, is that enough? Yeah. Was there another part of the question or? I guess I'm, I want to start prospecting the probate leads like immediately. And for one thing, I'm not sure if these probate situations have been filed and then they sat around for weeks before the attorney published them, the fact that the petition has been filed. I don't know what's going on. Exactly. No, it's getting recorded on public filing of the petition. You have access. Now, all the leads is gathering no, no more frequently than every two weeks, but it could be every month. I don't know. I don't remember in Maricopa. It could be a 30-day period from the last time a researcher was in there until the next time. So if someone comes, if they, if the researcher gets leads on May 28th, well, the researcher is not going back until June 28th. And if somebody filed on, on May 29th, if they filed probate, they could, someone else who's gathering their own data could have actually had a hold of that for a month. Now, the one thing- well, that, Nobody's going in there and, and gathering the data though, because the courthouse won't allow people in. It's funny. Well, however it's being done, if they have electronic access, people who are gathering daily do have an advantage. So you can do that. It's cost prohibitive for all the leads because we use, we use human researchers and not scrapers and Maricopa may be on bi-weekly delivery, like every two weeks, but it, you can, you can look at if you can do daily collection, but regardless, some people will have listed the home before the death even occurred because they're just proactive. If they have it together. You're never going to help those people. They, they don't need help. They, right. They're strong and they're diligent and they really just don't need that much leadership. It's the ones who procrastinate and, and don't know what to do and they freeze up and they think, well, I just want to dump this for whatever to just get, get, get away from this responsibility. Those are the ones we help the most. But so if you're coming up short on the phone, contact rates are the hardest thing. And follow up, follow up, follow up is the name of the game. And if you, all the way back to the very beginning of this phone call, the first thing we talked about is the thing that, that matters the most in prospecting, whether you're using artificial intelligence or using your cell phone, it's repetition, right? So it's discouraging, especially when you, you sit down and hammer out eight hours of calls and you met, you contacted 10, 15% of the people. But you just have to, you know, be persistent and hit it again the next day. Like just keep calling. But be the 10% of the people. I'm yeah, it's tough, man. And especially in a county like yours. So 
a lot of the reason I'm spending the, the time and energy to give you some of these different ideas is I, and I'll be frank here. I think you're going to burn out. I don't think you can sustainably continue making those calls with such low contact rates. So for me, it's important that you don't quit because I know this works. I know it works everywhere. I know it works in Maricopa. It's fine. It's my, I feel compelled to find an X factor for you, an edge, something that makes your offer different, something that met, that allows you to attract business while everybody else chases it and competes. So where is, where is Ronald's blue ocean and Maricopa County? And that's why a lot of the advice that I give you. So I can tell you to go hammer the phones and, and like some, some old school real estate coaches, some uh, the biggest organization, it's all about repetition. It's a numbers game. Keep track, keep dialing, but it only works for so long. And then you're like the hell with this man. I'm gonna... That book on blue ocean strategies, by the way, it was very good. Yeah. And uh, I'm trying to do some of those things. I had some videos that I had laid out. We, we had uh, interviews with partners, interviews with me, that kind of thing. And I've had two different video companies screw up. Uh, one of them gave me bad sound. It sounded like I was in a well. And the other one just never, never delivered the product. It's been over two weeks now. And, and I'm just frustrated with that whole thing. I think the videos are really good or could be, if they're done right, a really good uh, resource for attracting the business instead of chasing it. Yeah, the community college close to you? Yeah, there's several actually. It's Scottsdale Community, Paradise Valley Community College. Find one with a video department or with a digital marketing track and go over there and talk to the summer instructor and say, listen, I need interns. I need people that can edit video. I'll give them a steady flow of real projects to work on. That's a great idea. I was getting, they're not going to half-ass and they have deadlines. They're in yeah. Yeah, actually, that's a great. Thank you, Chad. I appreciate that. Yep. Hey, Chad. It's, it sounds like Ronald needs some wins. Can you give him some wins, some stuff that he's done now that's really put him in the right direction for being successful? You, you, Ronald, you seem run down a little bit, like discouraged, I guess is the word, but you, you got to hang in there. Yeah, I, I shouldn't be discouraged. I'm getting a listing today. I'm, I'm actually pretty excited about that. And I've got nice. another one coming, but I'm just, I still feel like I haven't cracked the code yet. And I need to find a way to, to get those people so I can refer them to my attorneys and keep those guys fed. Yeah. Keep raising your hand, man. There's, and thanks for calling, calling me out, Dan, like, honestly, not facetiously, like you've done things in the last two weeks that I haven't been able to get people to do in five damn years. Like when I tell somebody to create a custom audience in Facebook and, and go skip trace the leads and figure out your match points and, and create it and run an ad set. I have literally begged people for over three, four months before, because I knew they were about to quit. They didn't do it. They quit. So I'll, I'll commend you on taking action. Like this isn't just a whole bunch of talk and like sharing ideas. You're actually putting the ideas in, into play and that's rare. And yeah, success leaves clues. The people, the common thread among the, the people that I've coached that are most successful in this is they go try it. They go put it into action. They don't make excuses and say, I would have, but there was this. And then I was better than that, but there was that. And you're not doing that. Fuck it, I'll try it. You go do it. You put it into action. One of the, the ideas that we shared, I think it was last week, potentially the week before, John Fraker had suggested an estate planning council. Did you look into that in your market? Yes, I did look into that and uh, talked to them on the phone. They're, they're still not meeting in person yet. They're, st they're doing like Zoom calls and stuff. And uh, that, may be, that's, that may be valuable, but I haven't pulled the trigger on that. What's that? I just had an, I, I put a pen in an idea when you were talking earlier and I forgot to come back to it. Okay. Do you have a Facebook group for these families in pre-probate or pro? I do not. I have that, a that's my challenge for you. So my challenge for you this week is find a way to create a Facebook group that provides unique value to those people. And you, this is a place where you can invite the attorneys who are looking to earn that business and take all the people, all the idea about writing a book, take that and put it into a Facebook group, invite somebody from a city utility to come and talk about how, what to do. This becomes organic archived video in this property of your Facebook page that's shared in the group that goes on your YouTube channel. So everything that take the entire book idea and translate that to a Facebook group and make it a community resource for families in transition. And that's something you can implement and execute on starting right now. 
go have those conversations with those attorneys, invite them to contribute in the group by pulling up their Zoom and doing a 15 minute interview with you and feature them as the attorney in that group. Then go to the utility person and feature them. Then go to a social worker and feature them. Then go to a nursing home and take that commissioned person who gets paid to put heads in beds and feature them in an interview and do a series of interviews that are legitimately valuable to families who are in that deer in the headlights phase of I just lost somebody and create a group, bring the damn audience to you. And that's something that, that you should be able to, to execute on starting like right now, just start thinking about who are these people in the community that can really be of value to this family right now if they just lost somebody in the last seven days. Talk to funeral home directors, like what happens with a death certificate? How does it get to the courthouse? How does social security know when somebody passes away? Those are processes that happen with funeral home, the funeral administrators, but not everybody knows that like, and, and they're getting a bunch of, they're overwhelmed. So have that community conversation, archive that in a Facebook group and put that out there for everyone in Maricopa County to find, including your damn competition. Okay. So what, what do we call this? A Phoenix probate network or what? what? No. It's, they're not like, so the pre-probate, they're not even, they may not even be familiar with that term. So you could call it Phoenix life transitions or something like that. It's, it's, we'll not get lost. I don't want to give you shitty advice on branding that it'll take some time to sit, get creative and think that through, but whatever that brand is, like it, it's something about a transition, because if this works, if, if this gets traction, don't you want to work with people in trust administration? high net worth individuals, yeah, yeah, sure. Canadian internationals who own in your market. So you don't want to isolate. You don't want to box yourself in and say, oh, this is a probate group and somebody who's in trust administration or somebody who's exempt from probate. And I'll tell you, there are, imagine if, if people oftentimes, like if someone who has a family member going through that, that has passed away and they're exempt from the probate, that doesn't really mean the parent or the, the decedent didn't have much net worth. But if you can provide value to the people in their family who don't, who have, are just on a simple probate, who knows what they own, right? Like how many generations that the next generation just knocks it out of the park. Most self-made millionaires and billionaires had broke ass parents. Mm -hmm. So you never know who you might find in these groups, even if they're not going through probate, even if they're exempt from it, especially if they're in trust administration, but talk, think about it and, and, broader terms of not just a probate conversation, but a transition conversation. And even if you really want to get upstream of probate, get upstream of the death, start featuring elder care professionals, start talking about long-term care planning, start talking about what happens to a whole life policy and how a family, how long should they have to talk to an insurance agent and say, when somebody has a whole life policy and, and someone passes away, how, how quickly how long should it take for the beneficiaries to receive that benefit so they can then have those conversations publicly? No one else is. I, I challenge you to go find them. They're not there. People are too timid to do this. So this is you putting a flag in the sand in Maricopa saying, Let, this is, I'm, I'm serious. And then the time that you might spend hammering the phones to come up with 10% contact rates, I'll tell you, this is time better spent. Like you, this is evergreen. It will, it'll build a reputation that's, that lasts. And rather than you getting frustrated to a point where you, you're, you're willing to give up on it, do things like this. And this becomes a sellable brand. And that's the other thing to think about when you're naming it and branding it is who am I selling this to in 10 years, which, you know, which real estate investor, real estate agent, hedge fund will find so much value in this captive audience that I can sell this off as a business asset. So you don't want it to be the, the Ronald show. Make it something like, like Phoenix Life Transitions or Arizona Life Transitions or something like that. And then in your group description, you can be a little more specific about what you do. We help families in the transition to guardianship, to probate, to trust administration, divorce, whatever that might be. This is a community resource where professionals who can provide value to families in transition jump in and help and there's no cost we're here to we're here to earn your trust and ultimately if we help you earn your business and that's the message in your group description you should ask a few qualifying questions something like are you a competing real estate professional or i wouldn't do that because you don't want people to feel like you're only you know corralling them to eventually force them into a real estate conversation 
this is something that that you want to you want people to go holy crap who knew there was a facebook group for what i'm going through this is amazing i think this is a really good idea thank you very much i do appreciate it it was that's very really helpful yeah and uh, keep your head up man you're in one of those tough markets you've done a lot of things right you've to, for no longer than you've been in it, you've done well. Some people go six months to try to get a deal in markets like Maricopa or Colorado. So keep doing, keep flipping over stones. If, if you execute on everything we talked about here today, hell, our problem will be we won't see you again because you'll be too damn busy to come to these calls. David Pinnell, you need to go do the same thing in Fort Worth, buddy. Yeah, I'm just, I have a lot of things on my books. If Rosie was here, she'd give you a talking to. Yeah. To do, dump, and delegate it. Donna, you're up next. Uh, you've been patiently waiting. I'm actually in Maricopa too. I'm in Phoenix. I don't know if you remember me, but anyway, I, I just get you. an idea. It's been a while. Thanks for yeah, being here. I put a little note in there, this authorified book. This company creates these book templates and they're just little mini books. And then you brand it with your information. And it's this, my, the one I chose is called Tips and Tricks for Selling Your Inherited Home. And I've been giving this out and it looks like I wrote it. It looks like I'm, just, but it has, you check it out and you can add things to it if you want and, and tweak it a little bit, but it's all basic information. It's really good. And they love getting that little book. So I love the little book idea. But my question is, I'm going to, I just took an investor class as well. And I want to start doing some of the stuff that you've been doing as well as and I also finally have an estate sale guy on my team that's actually just referred me a property. I just got 16 offers on the property today. I'm presenting it to the client um, today on an estate. So he's actually moved to assisted living because that's one of my goals too, is that is even before probate, you know what I mean? Care homes, things like that. When they're moving, I just had one that's closing next week. That's a uh, you call it reverse mortgage. And what did that look like on getting it closed and sold? And it has four beneficiaries involved. And so as we've been learning like all along the way, but now I want to know, but my broker, I wanted to buy under an LLC as an investor. And I want to start doing some wholesaling as well as some remodels, flips and things like that. And then holds. So a combination eventually. So my broker though, made a comment to me because I'm a realtor and they did say this in the investor class that every state's going to have different rules that we, that I can't have another business within a business. And I think it's protective to buy, to have it under an LLC. So what does that look like? Is it just my broker, do you think, or what's the best way for me to start buying property? What unique value does your broker bring you to that? I'm a mentor in the mentoring program. So I get a little piece of that, but I, not nothing. I've been in the business 20 years. I there's I re I changed from Keller Williams to HomeSmart because it was cheap. Mm -hmm. HomeSmart's not very, not very expensive, but they are going to take a piece of everything I do. So I don't know what that looks like now. Is that as I talked to another investor agent yesterday and he said maybe you need to move brokerages, but yeah. I don't know. So I'm not going to start with that. What I would say is it's hard without being witness to the whole conversation. Right. It sounds like your broker's perception was you will be putting an LLC within an LLC that already contains your brokerage activity. And that would be dumb. But you, Donna, are a per Do you have your license in an LLC or do you have I your do. I have a PLLC. Yes, I do. Donna the person, the brokerage LLC. If right. you start an investment LLC over here in the eyes of the law in any state in the nation, that's a separate entity. Right. Even though if you're the managing member of both, it still doesn't mean that, that you are acting as your brokerage entity. You may be acting as Donna and Donna right. is a member, but there's no link back to your license from a legal standpoint. So if you're, if you've drawn that structure out, it's nope, I'm here. This branch is all for my, my brokerage activity. Just, just like full disclosure, of course, this branch is for all my investment activity and even full, even earlier and fuller disclosure over here. Okay. So Donna is a licensed real estate agent and these states and her, the, is entering into this transaction as a principal, not as a fiduciary, no agency relationship exists. And she fully intends to make a fat ass profit, a big, just disclaimer, all of those things. I have a real estate license. I am a principal. I am not your agent. I am right. not your fiduciary. I will make some damn money. Otherwise I wouldn't right. be doing this deal. And if your broker is not comfortable with that structure, then it's time you go find a new broker.
I just wondered if it's the E and O or something, and that particular brokerage does not allow it or something. I don't know because the company there's, not, there's a firewall. You have a legal you have a legal veil. So it's he, the thing is he probably thinks like when I it took me a dozen brokers before I found one that had the business savvy that could understand entity structuring decision for me I'm like oh you're the only person that hasn't told me what I'm doing is illegal when I know damn right, well, right. I, I can't wait to work together and we have a joke she's would you just get your damn broker's license already I'm like no I'm smarter than you yeah but, I don't want to be a broker but I just wanted to do it correctly and I wanted to make sure because I want to start wholesaling actually right away and and. That's one of the keys that make money, I think, a little faster to start planning on a retirement, basically. So I, I want to do it as another source. And I, anyway, I, I just found, I've been taking these courses and these guys are out of Texas and they have a different, they don't know the state, different state requirements. And they say that, but I can't even, the Arizona state requirement, I looked it up and I actually called the Arizona Real Estate Board and they told me I had to refer back to my broker. I cannot go direct to the legal department or anything, I'd have to hire my own lawyer. I go, that just seems crazy. Welcome to the, the bureaucratic runaround. Exactly. So I, I have literally thousands of friends who do both brokerage and investment and okay. everyone's structured very similarly. Okay. Like you have a separate entity, you have a separate EIN bank account, right. credit cards contain everything, your own copy of your own company and QuickBooks. None of that right. gets commingled. Co right. And it's where it becomes sloppy is if you're commingling, if you're moving money from one entity to the next and this bank account and you're buying stuff like a brokerage sign with your investment company credit card, you just pierced your corporate veil right. and your ass, your ass right. is grass, you're exposed. But if, if you properly structure this, it, it's, it, it is its own person. You are your own person and your brokerage is its own person in the eyes of the law in any state that I'm aware of. Okay. But the thing is like most brokers are, they have to be cautious, right? They're, they're representing a group of people right. that place themselves every three years. So it's not like we end up with this group of highly professional, savvy real estate agents. Right. They're professional babysitters in most cases. They've got to be extra careful about covering their assets because they could lose everything they've ever worked for because of one subcontractor making a bad decision. But you also have to, a broker has to realize, they have a responsibility to realize when they do have a savvy real estate professional and you're for on their behalf as a sub agent, you're condoning everyone else invest in real estate. How hypocritical is it that you're not allowed to yourself? Right. And that was always my position of these brokers. I'm like, so let me get this straight. You want me to go charge people. You want me on your behalf to go charge people to buy real estate, but you're not comfortable with me buying real estate. Help me understand. And I'd like, and then they never had a good answer. It's, I'm like, it's yeah. clear I'm in, the, I'm in the wrong office. But no, I like what if as long as you structure it that way, and I would recommend you buy as a person, <clears throat> as Donna, buy yourself an umbrella policy if you don't have it already. Your LLC that holds your brokerage is that has E and O insurance inside of it. You have a corporate veil. Your investment company will have the corporate veil. I usually don't recommend buying a, a, a perp like a dedicated insurance product for an LLC okay. in real estate because they like the, when I shopped for premiums, they were between five and $15,000 a year wow. because I admitted that I was doing creative financing and they didn't know what that meant. So the underwriters, oh, it's something different. I was like, you know what guys, the hell with it. I just went back to myself as a person and I bought a big umbrella policy in case anyone ever got through any of my veils. So that's your, your we're answer. talking about all the properties. Most, all of the properties would be off MLS. They would be on off market yeah. properties too. And I don't know a way, obviously I don't care. I don't really care if there's a way around paying the home smart, their portion. I could still do that. That's not a big deal, but it's just like, they don't have a portion. That's actually what I was told too, with the investments um, program network, but they're like insisting that I have to put their name on it. And I said, but I'm not acting as an agent. If that's the case, then you're breaking state law for sure. Certainly. If you're offering, if, if you are entering into a deal as a principal and, and putting a brokerage service behind that, like you're wearing both hats, like you're, they're putting you square into a gray area of the law 
and putting you at risk. And, and that that's ignorant damn advice. Like, right. why would you do that? If you're acting as Donna, the investor, they didn't, they did not procure the lead. They did right. not like, they have right. nothing to do with that. It is a completely separate relationship and it has nothing to do with them. And you certainly don't owe them a commission on it. And right. if they feel like you do, then this is easy. You, you're at the wrong brokerage. So one question I did have is, when you market, I know I've used your letters and stuff before, but when you market off market like this, are you required, maybe you don't know this, maybe this is a state thing, to put like the brokerage name on it when we're doing it, the off market stuff? No. Okay. Like you. Procure it as a listing and you want to list it. Which is you that. If you offer brokerage services, if you say, I'm a realtor. I would like right. to list your home. Right. If you're offering brokerage services, then yes, you should always put the, the, the minimum sure. disclosure. In. If you're not, if you're saying, hey, I, my name is Donna. I'm looking <laughs> to buy three houses in this neighborhood this year. Please give me a call. What the hell does your broker have to do with that? Donna, right. the managing member of an LLC that right. is set up for the sole purpose of investing in real estate, as your operating agreement will state, like... And I've had some trouble with it, not trouble. I've, I've had some people tattletale and report me for, because I had my investment company had its own professional yard signs. And they said like in Virginia, you have to put bro, uh, broker. Right. So right. I had the disclosures on the signs, but they were very professional. They matched the colors and the fonts were, were very similar to my team brand. But then people would say, oh, that damn Corbett guy, he's out there brokering deals off market. And the state investigator would call. I would say, James, listen, here's what happened. Here's my website. Here's a disclosure. Here's a copy of the purchase agreement. And he was like, oh, well, that's, this is pretty cool. You're doing a really good job. And we would close it up. Then I've coached other people who go through this same stuff because of tattletales. But even like in Chicago, they're really, in Illinois, they're really cracking down on wholesaling. They want to make sure that anyone who has anything to do with real estate has a license. Oh, yeah. I was told even that in investment classes that Chicago has to have a license. So even there, as tough as an environment as that has become for wholesalers, I have had one of my coaching students reported to the state and he had, it was his burden of proof that he was, that this structure that we're referencing was in fact legal and did, and he was, did not need a license to do what he was doing. And he got, he had nothing, no reprimand. He just, I said, here, just stay calm. This isn't a big deal. You didn't do right. anything wrong. Just document the separation between the businesses and clearly show that you are a human. That is the principle of this and a, a managing member of this and a managing member of this. And he, he submitted it. He was sweating bullets, his burden of proof. He's like, I'm going to lose my license. I'm like, no, you're not. You haven't done anything wrong. And the Illinois board said, oh, okay, we, we understand. And they closed it. I've heard more people than not, more brokers and more can, like retail agents than not say that Chad guy's full of shit. That's illegal. I'm telling you, it's not. It's just, you're probably sitting in front of the wrong broker. So Mark, when I go to present that though, I do have to disclose still that I am a licensed realtor, but I'm not acting right now as an act licensed realtor. I was overly thorough. I'm like Chad Corbett, the, the managing member of right. Resolutions LLC is a licensed agent in Virginia, West Virginia, Tennessee, Hawaii, Washington, like every single license that I had and, I, and I, those other points. And I don't know how important it is, but the, the, the regulatory body seemed to like it, but that I am entering into this transaction as the managing member and a principal, not a fiduciary caps, bold, no agency relationship right. exists. Okay. And I'm entering into this with the sole intent to make a profit. So okay. if I ever find myself in a courtroom defending my disclosure, right. I'd be like, what the hell didn't I say? I have five right. real estate licenses. I was coming into this as a principal. I did not have a realtor hat on and I would have done it if I wasn't going to make money. Right. And what the hell is the defense counsel going to say? I know in mastery, when we took mastery, you said that you, at first, I remember when you said you went there and you gave them the choice of did they want to put it on the market or did they want you to buy it? And you showed them the differences, very disclosed the differences of the cost and what you were going to make on it you just disclosed both of those so they had an idea they had a choice in yep. the beginning yeah I, I have that sheet right. like it's every appointment package is saved in a dropbox folder and it's a it's a you can see right. the creation date on the pdf so if anyone if, if anything ever would have gotten further down the road i would have said okay here's a secure pdf and here's the date that was created on you can audit the file but this right. is what they were given okay
Okay, awesome. Thank you. Mira had some advice. So she said, I also buy investment properties under separate LLCs. However, I do have to pay my broker his fees if it's a property listed on the MLS. I asked my broker to cut his fee since it's a property for me. I'm in New Jersey. Yeah, guys, I, like, and Mira, if you have a good brokerage relationship, I, I'm not here. I don't benefit from driving people to different brokerages. I don't play that game. There's a reason I'm with an indie brokerage and I turn down all the phone calls when people try to recruit me to be a recruiter. What's important to me is that you're in an environment that actually promotes growth and, and innovation. And Mira, what I would say is if you're truly just acting as the principal in a transaction and your broker's insisting on a commission, I don't think that's fair at all. Now, if his brokerage is incurring a cost or a, an administrative load on the acquisition of that asset, then that's a different thing. If you're running it through the transaction coordinators or the title company at the brokerage, and you're getting some benefit from that. And I don't think she's not here. Uh, Let's off it. I'm here. Her key that she said was is offered on the MLS. Once it's offered on the MLS, yes, we do have to pay brokerage fees and we have to pay the MLS or we can't, we have to pay a Cobro key then. Or right. you can't offer it on the MLS in the state of Arizona. At least. So I'm here, Chad. A couple of the deals that I, I worked on, yes, yeah, some were on the MLS. So I did have to pay up with my brokerage, but I just made a deal with my broker. But there what, was- Can you not make yourself an underrepresented party as a buyer? So that there's no load on the brokerage? Honestly, I never asked. That was my first one. And so I just thought that anything that we do, it has to go through the broker. I, I did later on try to get out of it with another deal, but it was a situation where the, I was trying to help the woman who had just lost her parents and she wanted to sell the house. So I was representing her as a agent first. But when then I, when I saw the property and I saw the condition of it, I said, she's not going to get what she's thinking. And I made an offer to her. When I talked to my broker, I told him the scenario that I first approached her as an agent and then later offered to purchase it myself. So he did not give me any advice to say, okay, I'm not going to charge you anything. What I would like you to present to your broker is, well, if, if I'm the managing member of this LLC right. and I'm also like, I'm presenting an offer as a realtor with the client having an unrepresented party addendum and me waiving my commission in the additional terms, then you're not picking up any liability or how can I represent myself as a principal in the transaction? The fact that something's on MLS, if it's not that broker's listing, and I just want to be clear. So this is another broker's listing that you are as a principal and in an investment LLC making an offer on your bro brokerage expects a commission. Yeah, that's one scenario. And then the second scenario was I made an offer to someone where it was not listed at all. And we did write up a, an agreement for the attorney saying that I am, I originally uh, started as a broker for her, but we never listed it and I'm waiving my commissions, but my broker still charged me a small admin fee, not small, but like a thousand bucks. Yeah. I, I don't think you have to do that, but if you're happy where you are and that's not, it's not. No, <laughs> I'm looking into switching out, but I didn't know I had this option. So it's good that I'm hearing this today because that is something I'm going to interview with the next broker. Yeah. All right, guys, Jonathan had asked, would you advise against cold emailing leads that we have email addresses for inviting them to the Facebook group? My answer is absolutely not. Go ahead and do it. Cold emailing, like it's not a big deal. So the other thing you can do, Jonathan, instead of just cold emailing them with at the risk of messing up your domain authority, you can also pull that list into a Facebook saved audience, run a join this group ad to them. So then you don't run the risk of messing up uh, your domain authority. Guys, this is, this is not, uh, some of the comments here. People have messaged me privately like, this is the best call we've ever had. So it's been a really great call. Lots of good ideas shared. I hope you guys got a ton from it. And as always, thank you for being here and being part of the conversation, part of the community and for everything you do for us. Have a great day, guys.